we, we kind of all do somewhat. And Jimmy's even, oh, I'm here. Uh, our scripture is coming from the uh, prophet, from Isaiah, uh, chapter 43, in fact. And uh, it is the prophet's time of uh, the second segment of Isaiah. So the exiles in Babylon are looking to return home. And in the midst of that not knowing comes the word of God in chapter 43, beginning with verse 16. Thus says the Lord, through the sea, and a path through the mighty waters, and who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man. They will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new, and now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, and the beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We want you to join us in praise this morning to sing the Hosanna unto God, because indeed our praise should be rising to him. Would you rise to your feet? Praise is rising, eyes are turning.
I would invite, if I could, our deacons who are serving communion to come and sit down here as we prepare ourselves for the table. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As we prepare for the table, let us bow together. Lord, bless now the elements here that remind us of what you have done for us. Through the bread that reminds us of your broken body, to the cup that reminds us of the blood you have spilled. Be with us now, Lord. As we take these elements into ourselves, may we remember even more so to receive your spirit into ourselves as well. For we pray in the name of the one who beckons us at this table, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Would the deacons please rise? If you do, we'll do this side and you do that side.
scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with the disciples celebrating the Passover. And he took the bread that evening and he blessed it and he broke it. And he handed it to all of them and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Eat. Throughout our time together on this Lenten journey, we have paused as God's children to pray together in confession to him. We do so now. I'm going to invite you to see your part that comes up on the screen. And then at the end, if you would join together with all of us on the choral response of Lord have mercy. Let the people of God come to God in prayer. Merciful God, forgive us when we stray from your path and succumb to the temptation of the moment. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your path. Forgive us for failing to see every person as one of your beloved children. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your path. Forgive us when we fail to share from the resources we have, when others go hungry for lack of food or have no place to rest. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your path. Forgive us when we hold on to our anger and hurts, failing to forgive as you have forgiven us. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your path. Forgive us when we forget to live our lives in a way that shows that you are our God and we are your people. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your path. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Believing the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen.
just as he had done with the bread, Jesus took the cup of the meal and blessed it and gave it to all of his disciples and told them, This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now may we continue to worship Christ in the way that he deserves to be worshipped. Would you rise to your feet with me and let us continue our praise in song to him today. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain there is a faith proved of more worth than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory in me. This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and go heir with Christ So firm on His promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God is my victory in me is here All of my life, in every season You are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship All of my life In every season You are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship All of my life, in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to see, I have a reason to worship, I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain, I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory, and He is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received, I will sow.
This is time for our children's moment. If our young people want to come join me over in the corner for our children's moment, come on. Good morning, love your hair. <laughs> There's something a little different down here in worship. We did something that we don't always do. We only do it on different times and special kind of occasions. You see the table over there? Did you happen to see what was in those trays that came around? What was in them? You don't know? Okay. Was there, um, there was a little white thing, wasn't there? And that's bread, okay? Yeah, it, it's kind of crackery-like. It's supposed to be unleavened bread, which means it's not the kind you really want to make a sandwich with. It, you, you hurry up to bake it. The second one is the cup, and it had... Grape juice, that's right. Uh, and it, it reminds us of two important things. Jesus told us whenever we got together on special times together as his children, we were to remember him this way. The little bread reminds us, because it's so hard and it's easy to break, it reminds us of the broken body. It means Jesus broke his body, gave himself on the cross for us. The grape juice reminds us of what do you think? His blood, the blood that Jesus shed from being crucified on that cross. And we do that, and it says to remember him this way. Well, it's not just to eat and to drink. The best way to remember somebody is to do something special that, you know, they did that you would like to do too sometime. So as followers of Jesus, we want to do things that Jesus did and asked us to do. Be kind to other people. You know, those who are hungry, try to find them something to eat. Help out those who probably don't have friends and become their friend so that they don't feel like they're outside of everybody else. So a lot of those things are just simple. And yet Jesus told us to do that as well, to remember him just as that is. So let's bow together and have prayer. Lord, remind not just the girls but all of us that we do a lot of things in remembrance of you. So let us continue to be faithful to do them. For we pray in your son's name. Amen. Now, I think you guys are going to go with Trish Shiflett, who may have left the, yeah, her coffee to keep her going. <laughs> okay. If you all want to go with her. Bye-bye. Where are we going? You all never sound that excited nor inquisitive when you come in here on Sunday mornings. So how's things going with your Lenten discipline? Yeah, I asked it last week. I'm asking it again. We're in the fifth week now. Five weeks. That's pretty good. But it's also the dangerous time for us to ask that question. Because my guess is that, you know, just like every other journey, you begin really excited and pumped up. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do that. And everything may be going well for a day or two or a week or two weeks even. And then comes that one morning when you wake up and you roll over and maybe you pick up it's on your phone or something, but you have right in front of you your to-do list that's got to get done that day. And immediately you say to yourself, what? It's over. I, I can't do this. I can't keep up with what I committed myself to in, 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 in my Lenten discipline. Today is not the day <laughs> to keep it going. And, and it's understandable. But once we do that, what happens the next day? Well, you know, I don't know if I can get back to it today either. And then, you know, another day goes by and maybe three out of four, four out of six, yeah. Uh, and then it just gets worse and worse, and we get guilty about it. But the truth is, it doesn't have to be that way. The prophet Isaiah doesn't think that it should be that way. In fact, he says in the passage that we read at the start of our worship service, Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. And it springs forth, do you not perceive it? And then, just to kind of make sure that no one misses the point, as only this prophet can do, he adds some poetic color, and he says, I will make a way in the wilderness, 
and rivers in the desert. You don't associate those two things in the in the desert. You don't asso- or wilderness. You don't associate you know the roads to the wilderness. I'm uh, you know I'm from Kentucky and we had two or three different people that kind of are our founders who came over and and chopped out parts of the wilderness that was Kentucky and and built uh, settlements and built towns and whatever. Of course, the most famous is Fess Parker. I mean uh, Daniel Boone. Um, and, uh, you know, but Daniel Boone, you know, made many trips back and forth. And it took him a while, but he was making a road, the wilderness uh, way, the wilderness road through the Cumberland Gap and into uh, Kentucky. By the way, I've always loved the story that was told that years and, and years later in his older days, a reporter, or I guess it was not a biographer at that time, uh, asked Daniel Boone, was he ever lost? Daniel Boone said, no, sir. But I was a might bewildered for three days once. That's how we can feel. But these verses belong to the second prophet of Isaiah, and the middle portion of that that is about the exiles in Babylon starting to think about returning home. I mean, if anybody can be more stuck in their spiritual lives, it's got to be people who've been mired into slavery and despairing and finding a way out. I mean, they, they have got to be the ones for a generation or so who have found themselves basically, you know, homeless in a foreign land. But here comes Isaiah, and he weaves this powerful poetic vision of marching everyone, all of these exiles, going back home. Now, it's going to be a new home. It's going to be a new place. Well, Mike, it's going to be the same zip code. It's still going, an area code is still going to be, you know, Jerusalem, you know, 606 or whatever. I mean, it's going to be that. No, it's not. Isaiah is preparing them that we are going to not only travel a new way, it's going to be a new place. How small-minded are we to imagine that our spiritual disciplines, uh, Linton and otherwise, can be broken beyond repair? For this passage reminds us anything can be repaired. If God is a part of it, we can repair anything. Or it may not look like we thought it would or wanted it to be, but God is the road builder in the wilderness. God is the desert gardener by the river in a desert of sand and heat. But it takes the unafraid to trust God to make a river in the desert. It doesn't sound logical. It, it takes the unafraid to trust God, though. How do we do that? Well, first of all, forsake the pulling of the past, in a sense, the prophet says. You know, sometimes our past is our worst enemy, and what I mean by that is that if things have continued to happen badly, we just figure sooner or later the bottom's going to fall out. Got to. That's, that's, you know, that's the way it is. Or there have been terrible moments in our lives that have shaped, maybe jaded us in some way towards others or even towards God himself. But the prophet says we need to be able to put the past into the past and recover and make a new future together. The late Senator John McCain was famed not only for being a senator but for his service as a United States um, Navy pilot. In Vietnam in 67, he was shot down, beaten up by uh, local villagers who found him there and took him off to Hanoi to prison there. Many of those years spent in solitary confinement away from others. Years later, reporters wanted to know <clears throat> when the uh, senator returned to Vietnam in 2000 on a, uh, a, a mission of peace kind of to reestablish relationships with Hanoi. They asked him, How did he feel being back there? Was he angry? Was he bitter? His reply was, no, I put the war behind me a long time ago. I don't harbor anger or rancor towards any of them. In fact, I only look for what's ahead of me. To forsake the past and to look ahead. If you, it's baseball season. Hopefully pretty soon they'll be playing for real. And, uh, one of the great stories of baseball lore in my lifetime was a pitcher on, for the Dodgers a few decades back entitled, or whose name was Oral Hershiser. 
And in his biography about, it, uh, about his career in the book Out of the Blue, Hershiser says the secret of his success, if he would call it that, was simply that he had a peculiar focus as a pitcher to put the last pitch out of his mind and worry only about what the next pitch is that I'm going to throw. If I throw a home run ball, it's the next pitch that matters. If I throw a strike and the umpire calls it a ball, it's the next pitch that matters. Well, in our own lives, in a similar way, we do well to give full attention to each day that way. Yesterday cannot have anything more done to it. It is over. It cannot go farther. But today is the day that I can fix whatever was broken yesterday. Today is the day that I can look ahead to what is coming before me and what I need to get to that. The second thing we have to do is to overcome the inertia, though, of the present. Paul, in Philippians, speaks about straining forward to what lies ahead. And that's a familiar idea. Paul was very good at capturing the, the times that he lived in. We often think of, of that era as one that was so primitive and so uh, different than our own, and in many ways you could say that. But at the same time, it was very similar. Those Greeks and Romans, they knew how to throw sports out. They just didn't have mass communication to go with it. <laughs> but they loved stadium contests. These were largely military cultures, and so out of that experience of, uh, of, of warfare, even when there was no war, there, was, there were track and field events for these soldiers and these others who were athletic to take place, and that image of the runner who is going forward and not looking backwards, only looking at the line ahead of him, is exactly what Paul captured there. It was to understand that we have to keep our physical inertia going to get to the finish line. Well, there's also such thing as spiritual inertia. How easily we grow comfortable and complacent in our spiritual lives, holding tightly to uh, what it used to call when I was a kid, same old, same old. New hymn, new song, don't want to learn it. Guitars and drums in the sanctuary, I don't want any part of that. I can't really tell you why not. It just doesn't feel like what I want. Well, what's that you say? You want me to get more actively involved in, in, in something in the church? Look, I've been fine sitting where I'm at. I'm comfortable. Don't make me have to be uncomfortable. There's a word for the inertia of the present that we get ourselves caught into, and it's a fine old theological term. In fact, it's one of the things that is numbered among the seven deadly sins. Sloth. Now, I'm not talking about the cute animal with the long nails. You know, uh, I, I, I'm not talking about that. But sloth is not only what we call lazy. It's, it's really, sloth is about, I am too tired to give you the energy to change again. To start a new thing. Now, if anyone feels that feeling... It has to be those of us who have survived two years of my affectionate term of COVID land without Woody Harrelson. Sloth is a kind of virus that gets into us and keeps us from focusing on what brings life and meaning together. It keeps us from believing that God can actually be up to something, anything new. Because our phrase throughout those two years was what? Lord, I just wanted to get back to the way it was. I just want to go back to the way it used to be. Kathleen Norris is a Presbyterian elder who's written many books extensively about her own spiritual journey. Books like Dakota and the Cloister Walk, she wrote of her experience in a Benedictine monastery. She wrote about contemplative traditions of Christianity. But after all this literary success and all these people who took great um, uh, both uh, passionate comfort but also uh, a great instilling of fire within us to move forward out of those works, Kathleen discovered that sometimes that could happen, the, these spiritual problems can happen to her. Her husband got cancer and needed constant care. Her aging father needed more help than her likewise aging mother could give, her, give him. So she moved back to her native Honolulu, 
cared for both her husband and her father, and here's what she wrote. She said, I could generally meet my responsibilities as a caregiver to my husband and to my dying father and help support my mother, but the truth is, as I did that, I felt dead inside. I dreaded waking up in the morning and sometimes went straight from bed to the couch where I would watch television, do crossword puzzles, until it became absolutely necessary to rouse myself into doing some type of activity. She called it the hateful noonday demon of the desert monks. They found me in the lush environs of Honolulu and made me unable to respond to God's beauty that was around me. I was a weaker soul than I would admit to others. We often think of sloth, she said, as harmless form of physical laziness and a joke about how long it's been since we vacuumed. <laughs> but sloth is much more. It's an inability to concentrate on the serious things that matter and the profound weariness of the soul. Kathleen learned it was all about her inability to focus. She felt pulled in so many directions, so many things to do, so many chores, so many people who needed part of her. She slipped into this passivity that was able to only do the bare minimum of what had to be done. Distractions can be a problem for us staying focused on what is a new thing that God wants us to do. We get caught up in what we have to do, and we don't feel like we've got enough energy to give to a new vision. Because these things take our, our sight away. Do you ever wonder why a lion tamer gets into the big cage with the lion with only a chair and a whip? I don't know about you, but most lions I know should probably, you know, eat the whip and, you know, punch through the chair to get to the guy. But the reason they use this chair is it has these legs, these four legs, and when he waves it in front of the lion, the lion focuses on what's in front of it. And what he focuses on is, are the four different legs. And his brain and his neuro, neurons cannot process fast enough, you know, which one to focus on. And so it keeps him confused. It keeps his mind off center. It's kind of a mental paralysis, if you will. As the king of the beast becomes passive and weak and disabled, all just because his attention is all messed up. We lose our ability to press forward to what lies ahead if we get our focus off of so many things that we cannot focus also on God. Our call to the future is what we should listen to, though. Remember Paul said, press on toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, the prophet Isaiah is saying, we are going forward. I am going to be taking you out of this land of exile that most of you have only known. And I'm going to take you back to your homeland, which is going to be different. But I'm going to get you there. If I have to make new roads in a desert or a wilderness, and if I have to make rivers run through a desert, I will do it. Because I'm doing something new in you, my children. Why does a runner run? Well, unless he or she happens to be on a treadmill, the runner runs to get somewhere. Get the finish line. They had the race yesterday. I'm so proud of Michael Harrison, Community Fellowship. He's, he's my hero. Doesn't mean I'm changing anything, but he's my hero. You know. Maybe it's, you know, his goal was to run to finish the race. In my case, if I'm running, it's because something's after me, and I want to make sure that I outrun it, or at least you. The French Jesuit scientist and theologian Chardin once wrote, The whole future of the earth as a faith seems to me to depend on the awakening of our faith in our future. We are, as churches, prone to paralyzed thinking. We... We like comfortability. I like comfortability. So do you. That in some ways, it kind of makes us feel like maybe that's why we're here, is we're protecting our, 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 our tradition, our, our history, ourselves. Each generation, though, whether we realize it or not, must take up the traditions of the past and 
kind of tweak them or refashion them to fit into our present. And if ever we fail to do that, we risk losing our precious traditions altogether because we, we risk, you know, dying. But what we forget is the tradition we love today was first a new thing in its time. You know, we, we weren't, you know, thrown out there in Jerusalem and Antioch or wherever, you know, singing uh, revival songs. We weren't thrown out there, you know, looking like this, but for a short period of time in the history of faith. Paul says, listen to God's call, and, it, and that, I understand that, because the truth of the matter is, Philip Yancey said, faith is believing in advance what will only make sense when we look back on it in reverse. Like the Hebrews that Isaiah wrote to, we have a future promise in front of us. We have hope in front of us. The promise of our faith, the promise that God is not finished with us yet. God is not finished with me yet. I once had a lady in my last church who said, when can I stop doing these things? And I said, well, uh, when I pronounce the benediction at the grave, I will let you know. <laughs> we keep on walking through the road made for us in the wilderness, drinking the water from the river in our desert. Why? Because we've heard the promise, and we believe it. It's the same promise that got us here. It's the same promise that brought you here. It's the same promise that we pray will take us where God's calling us to. New things. New things. God's doing a new thing. Let's bow together. Lord God, we thank you so much for doing a new thing. Been doing a new thing all along, Lord. Heavenly Father, I remember a time when I thought a new thing was singing out of the Sing and Celebrate songbook, singing songs about Pass It On and Wish We'd All Been Ready and those kinds of songs. And now, Lord, it's a new thing and a new time. Doesn't mean we forget it means that we press on. So remind us, Lord, that you're working a new thing. And if you're doing that for your church, what might you be doing for my life and the lives of those around me? Thank you for doing a new thing and starting a new thing. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you, if you would, to stand with me and let us sing together in this moment of invitation and opportunity in front of us. Now go from this place and know that in your life and around you, God is making a new thing. And trust him to have a road through the wilderness in front of you, a river in the desert before you, and a home that he's taking you to. Amen.